So, okay then. So um, we'll now start with uh, Dharma's very first um, e-seminar. So we'd like to welcome everybody to that. Thank you for joining us. Um, just to confirm, Melvin will be presenting for 30 minutes and that will be followed by question time during which both sessions we have uh, Mark Thompson from Hertfordshire who will be the facilitator. So we welcome questions throughout um, the presentation of question time. And just to remind everybody that they must submit questions through the chat. Um, and then the facilitator, Mark, will um, select which questions uh, go forward and he'll let you know uh, when it's your time to, to ask the question. Mark, would you like to add anything to, to that? No, that, that sounds pretty good. Thank you, Trish. Okay. Um, first protocol, uh, if you haven't already done so, could you please add your name and country to the chat? Um, we'll be using that just to take a register of everybody who's attended. So we'd appreciate that. If you haven't already done that, if you can do that now, please. Um, I'd also like to confirm that we will be recording um, this, this um, e-seminar um, and the idea is that we'll share that with people who are unable to attend and this may even feature on the website too. Um, if everybody could please keep uh, the sound muted and the video switched off throughout um, and the only time that really needs switching on is if, if you get selected to, to ask a question. So that's basically most of the house rules. Um, I will now pass over to, to Melvin, who will uh, welcome you again. Indeed, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, it's uh, great to see so many uh, familiar names and faces uh, joining the, this first e-seminar. So the... Um, the idea here is really, we had this idea before the whole um, outbreak actually of coronavirus actually started. So we were already thinking about uh, uh, doing this, but what, you know, with the, uh, with the outbreak now as well, it, it seems even more important to try out this new way of perhaps communicating with uh, all of the people who've been on the, uh, uh, the DARA training uh, across Africa before. Um, so we're very much trying this out for the first time. Uh, so we're aware that many of you may be on, you know, slow connections. Um, so, you know, bear with it. As Trish said, the sessions are being recorded. So there'll be a chance to, uh, watch these back. Maybe when you've got a better connection, if you are having trouble, so, so try and stick with it. Um, we also want to use this first session really to, um, you know, to gather your input uh, on uh, and feedback on how to run uh, these sessions. Like I say, it's the first time we've done it, so we're going to be learning uh, as we go. So um, I'm going to use this first one to really uh, look at the kind of current status of the DARA project, you know, how we've got to where we are. So some of you perhaps, you know, haven't been in touch with us for a number of years. So, uh, you know, it's a chance to see what's going on in the project at the moment. Uh, also, perhaps more importantly, we're coming to the end of this first phase of our DARA funding and uh, we want to, um, you know, start to look at uh, how we move forward. And of course, we'd very much like your input uh, on that as well. Okay, so let me, Try to share my screen so we can get a talk going. Dun, dun, dun. So if everyone who's just joined, if they can um, mute their sound and mute their video just to keep the connections uh, strong, that would be great. Okay, um, hopefully now everyone can, can see my screen and the talk 
the title page of the talk coming up. Um, if there are any issues, then maybe Trish can either email me or um, or put something in the chat and I can have a look now and again, although I'm, I can't see the chat myself now. Okay, so let's say we're gonna talk about uh, Dara now and future. And so the first thing to say really is that, you know, I think Dara has been a great success up to now. Um, you can measure success in a number of ways. Uh, one way, of course, is uh, the amount of funding that we are bringing in uh, to deliver the project. And so that has increased dramatically over, the, uh, over this period. So we're now over, well over four million pounds of UK funding have gone into the, uh, the DARA project. Um, of course, it's a joint project between the UK and South Africa. And so we've had match resources uh, coming in from South Africa, uh, both in cash and in kind. And uh, in more recent times, we've also had uh, support from the EU um, with a uh, work package led by Rob Bezik from Manchester, uh, where we've had the jumping jive money uh, to come and bring uh, EU radio astronomy trainers uh, into the project to help the training. And um, so you can see the different um, funding agencies uh, at the bottom here. Okay, let me just check the chat in case People can't see if everything is okay. Okay, good. Uh, I need to get rid of that. Okay, so you'll see a key date on here originally was that this project, the whole funding of the current project is due to end uh, at the end of March 2021, which of course is less than a year away. Um, and obviously that was already beginning to focus our mind. But with recent developments, with the outbreak of the virus, then uh, that was causing us large problems. And so we are in negotiation with our, with our funders at STFC in the UK to extend that um, end date to March 22. So we're, we're requesting a, an extension to the project uh, by a year in order to uh, overcome the issues uh, set up by, by the COVID outbreak. And uh, as I mentioned that, then I, you know, I very much hope you're all uh, staying safe in, in your respective countries, uh, as we're all trying to do uh, here in the UK as well. So I just want to show, recap for a moment how uh, sort of DARA originated and how it's grown over the years. Of course, um, it started as a very small project just between um, Leeds, Ghana and uh, SK uh, South Africa with the Royal Society Award back in 2014-15. Uh, but very quickly from that uh, initial start, then we've grown into the DARA project itself. So we had a first phase of funding where we extended that model that was developed uh, in Ghana to uh, first Zambia and Kenya, and then a year later to a joint Namibia-Botswana cohort. And at the same time, we started the sort of the PhDs and masters places in, in the UK uh, and South Africa. And then we had a big increase in funding, uh, which we refer to as phase two. So that brought in uh, Madagascar and Mozambique to the basic training program. We had another round of PhDs and masters. Um, and a year later, uh, the Royal Society funding in Ghana ended and we we brought Ghana into the in fully into the Dara fold as well and so that meant we were effectively training in all seven AVN countries um, at that time obviously Mauritius was not uh, involved in the basic training because they have a good uh, radio astronomy training program uh, at the university already but Recently, then they have joined in as well uh, with advanced training places uh, hosted in Mauritius itself. So there are six MPhil students uh, in Mauritius, many of whom I saw joining this this e seminar. So great to have you on board. And sort of coming up to this year, um, then uh, we were we had the final call for uh, another uh, six or seven MSc training places in the UK. They were supposed to be starting pretty much this week, uh, but that's all been delayed, obviously, with the travel bans and everything. 
And so we're hoping perhaps they can start in October. I know I've noticed some of those have also joined the seminar, so welcome. We're, we, we hope to be welcoming you to the UK in October. But the big problem is um, we also have now had to uh, suspend uh, and postpone the basic training program uh, that was gonna be carried out you know, over the next few months. So that's basic, the steering committee took the decision to put that back a whole year to make sure that you know, we've fully come out of the, uh, the virus outbreak and that we can go forward and plan with confidence for uh, restarting that training around Easter next year. Of course, as I mentioned, we, we're asking for this no-cost extension uh, and that should allow us to complete uh, another round of uh, the final round of our basic training uh, in up to March 22. And something that, you know, is the focus of, of this talk a little bit towards the end will be, you know, we'll be in this time period, we're going to be bidding for the future funding, uh, which we're sort of calling phase three. Okay, so over that uh, expansion of the DARA program from, you know, from the original when it was just Leeds, we, then we had Manchester, Oxford and Hertfordshire join in for phase one. More recently, we've had uh, University of Central Lancashire and Bristol in the UK join uh, as new academic partners to help deliver the expanded training program uh, in the UK or from the UK. There have also been several changes on the uh, South African side in recent times. Um, we've had this new organization emerge in South Africa, which merges sort of what used to be SKA South Africa and, and uh, Hartrau, the observatory where the the practical training was done so that's merged under one organization called Soreo. Uh, we've also had a sort of change of the DARA PI which used to be Alette uh, DeWitt and now it's uh, Carla Sharp who heads up the Africa program at Soreo. Uh, we've also had other South African universities come on board uh, such as uh, uh, Roger Dean's group at the University of Pretoria who have been uh, you know great new friends to the, uh, the project. As we've added more countries, then we've added more uh, partner institutions uh, in the ABN partner countries. Uh, so we've, we've had a yoga in Madagascar, uh, UEM in Mozambique, uh, and most recently, uh, the University of Mauritius has, has joined us as well. So just a reminder of the terminology that we use within the DARA project. Uh, so obviously we have the basic training program that takes place mostly you know, in, in country uh, and in Africa. And then we have the advanced training program with masters and PhD places, uh, either in the UK or in South Africa or in the, in the home countries. Um, just to explain this picture here, this is the uh, uh, more, one of the more recent uh, set of UK uh, PhD and master students uh, visiting Ian Jones, who many of you might recognize, who's the CEO at Goonhilly. Uh, and this is when we, we gathered all the uh, advanced training students down, down at down at the Goonhilly Earth Station to see what's going on there. Okay, so in terms of basic training, where are we up to? Well, the numbers are getting quite impressive now. So we've, uh, over 200 people have been through the, uh, the DARA basic training program. Uh, this is the, the latest picture from the annual network meeting. So you can see it's getting uh, bigger and bigger uh, each year. Um, so we now have you know, 60 students coming, coming to that meeting. Obviously the, uh, the current cohort uh, is currently uh, delayed, but we uh, put, in, put in place plans to complete that uh, next year now. Uh, and we still plan to go ahead and recruit a final cohort. So we'll probably recruit them um, sort of later this year and, and get, that, get that underway to make sure that we can um, or, or in 2021 to make sure that we can finish everything in, in 20, March 22. We've also had new partners along the way. Uh, so uh, the Center for High Performance Computing in South Africa has been uh, taken over the delivery of the, of the computing skills, the Linux and Python skills. Uh, and so they've been doing a great job. You can see uh, uh, Daniel Moaketsi and, and colleagues here uh, delivering some of that training uh, in action. Uh, so that's been a, that's been a, a welcome uh, boost to the project. And 
in recent times than you know, many of you will have done your practical training at Hartrau, as you can see on the left. But more recently now, the Ghanaians and the Kenyan cohorts are going to the, the newly commissioned dish uh, in Ghana itself. Uh, so this is the 32 meter at the Ghana Radio Astronomy Observatory, uh, GRAO. And uh, that's, you know, that's now a site for the practical training itself, which of course is a, a nice uh, way to uh, show progress being made that we, we have a new radio telescope on the African continent. Um, in terms of the uh, advanced training, uh, then this is uh, kind of where we are now. Um, so there've been numerous, uh, so seven PhDs, eight, eight masters, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of masters are completed now um, in the UK, um, in Africa as well, we've got PhDs, masters uh, have uh, been underway and, and a lot of those have been completed. We've started these six new uh, MPhil, so sort of two-year positions that could eventually, if we get more funding, lead into PhDs as well. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we've recently awarded seven more uh, masters in the UK, uh, just with the, the delayed start. So this, is, this was the first uh, cohort on the, on the right here in the picture uh, that were recruited to the UK. And um, again, many of these are on the call, I believe. Uh, so it's uh, pleased that uh, Willis here is, is, is the first of the Dara PhD students to actually uh, graduate, has passed his, uh, his PhD thesis and currently doing an internship over in the University of Manchester uh, for a few months. Um, uh, Naomi just submitted uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Deliso is back in Zambia and just finishing up his uh, thesis. Um, Emmanuel and Mubella are both doing PhDs in the UK. Um, and, uh, and Noah has, is now in South Africa doing a PhD. So um, after his master's in the UK. So you can see that you know, we've got a pretty good track record in people moving on uh, and completing their, their studies and moving up. Uh, the career path. So this table here uh, just shows you the kind of distribution of the sort of basic and advanced trainees uh, by country uh, and that kind of reflects you know from Adara's perspective the the order in which we sort of have, have expanded the training uh, over the years um, and that was driven initially by you know, which country, you know, we took the lead from South Africa about which countries were expecting to get their, uh, their AVN telescopes at the beginning. Um, you know, that situation is changing a little as we shall discuss a bit later. Um, but you can see that, you know, Ghana, Kenya and Zambia were, have got the, have had the most um, because that's where we started uh, in the, the earliest times. But, you know, we're getting a pretty good distribution by by country now and we especially for the advanced trainees we've been trying to balance that up uh, over the over the years as we recruit uh, new cohorts and um you know there is a bigger picture here of course because there's also the dara big data project that i'll mention a bit later um and um you know countries like botswana are re represented on that side of the project as well um so as well as as well as Willis being the first uh, PhD coming out of Dara, then he's also uh, published the first refereed paper. So we were very pleased to see that. So the, uh, so Willis has, has led this uh, paper that uh, came out last year. So Dara is beginning to produce papers, and and the other the other Dara PhD students are are not far behind. Mm -hmm. I'll just mention a few other um, uh, sort of. Uh, benefits along the way. So at Leeds, uh, we've, at the university, we've been getting more funds along the way. So the big amount of DARA funding has led to other smaller amounts of funding that come through the university. Uh, and with those, we've been uh, supplementing our um, uh, provision uh, to the various countries. So one of the, one thing that has arrived now in each country is one of these uh, portable eight inch modern Celestron telescopes, um, which is excellent. You can see here in the picture has already being used uh, for outreach. Um, so they're excellent for that. You can take them out anywhere you like and, uh, and set them up and they're fairly easy to use. Um, so that's, that's happening. 
coming soon um, will be a CCD camera, like the picture on the right here, so that that point, uh, and with a laptop and a software as well, you'll be able to use the telescope and the CCD together, and this would uh, form the basis of a good undergraduate uh, uh, experiment, so that people can start to do practical astronomy uh, within the local universities as well. So there's a dual purpose for those telescopes. Also, as part of DARA, we've been uh, getting together with the uh, IAU Office of Astronomy for Development, the OAD, run by uh, uh, Kevin Govinder and Vanessa McBride uh, in Cape Town, and, and basically funding uh, these small development projects uh, each year. So each cohort uh, dreaming up a, a project whereby uh, you can use uh, your sort of astronomy knowledge, but try and apply that to either generate uh, jobs or income or wealth in, in some form. So I illustrate this here with the uh, Sayari project in Kenya, which has uh, been doing great stuff, where they've been going to game lodges and training the, uh, the, the game lodge guides uh, in, in astronomy using telescopes and talking about night, uh, light pollution, etc. <clears throat> so Another thing that uh, we've been funding, uh, firstly temporarily, but now uh, bringing fully into the, into the project are a couple of consultants. So again, a lot of you have probably been receiving emails from uh, Steve Jones, who's the Dara business consultant. He's also the form, former commercial director for uh, Goon Hillier Station Limited in the UK. So has a lot of experience of this interface between academia and the commercial space sector. Uh, and so, again, any of you, and I know many of you on the call have, have been calling upon his expertise. You have a business idea that's, you know, linked to uh, the sort of skills that you've um, gained through the DARA program or been inspired to think about through the DARA program. And, um, and I know he's back busy again now uh, advising uh, individuals uh, as well as the development project groups on, on developing their business plans. So, you know, if you, if you do have an idea and you, you haven't uh, sort of approached uh, Steve in recent times, then he's back being employed now for the next year or so. So, um, so please uh, uh, get in touch with him. Um, another consultant that we've got on board is an antenna consultant, Rod Hines. So he's a retired engin antenna engineer. Um, he actually worked on the original Longanot dish in Kenya back in the 1970s, so many, many years experience. Uh, and so he's uh, advising uh, people ar uh, around the world on, on dish conversions. Um, and so that's, that's another aspect that we're trying to help with in Dara now. So as you're probably also aware, then, you know, the original sort of core Dara project has now um, been uh, expanded and extended into lots of other directions and also countries, as we shall see. Um, so closest to home is the sort of sister project, Dara Big Data, that's gained over, well, actually it's more like two and a half million uh, pounds of funding now, uh, led by Anna Scaife at Manchester in, in collaboration with Russ Taylor from IDEA in South Africa. So that's funding PhDs and masters both in the UK and South Africa. Uh, in this sort of <clears throat> interface region, if you like, where big data skills in radio astronomy are translated into other areas, mainly agricultural and the health uh, sectors. Um, so an emphasis on, you know, uh, big data analytic techniques coming out of radio astronomy and going into other fields and vice versa. Um, this is a rather busy diagram, um, but it, it's a way of trying to capture how the, the sort of Dara family has now gone global, if you like. Uh, so in, in green through the middle here are the various grants that have funded uh, Dara over the years. So starting with the small Royal Society grant and building up into the big uh, Dara grants here. Um, and you've got Dara big data spinning off uh, over here. But in fact, uh, from a UK perspective, then uh, the, the sort of idea of using a Radio astronomy for development has expanded into Latin America. So we've got a couple of uh, technical instrumentation projects going in, 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 in Latin America, especially in Mexico, where there's a dish conversion going on. Uh, there's a, another big data project going on in Colombia. So these, these ones in blue are led by other members uh, by Oxford, uh, the, the 
purple ones are led by Manchester. And um, Mark, who's, who's uh, facilitating the Q&A a bit later, is leading this one in, in, in Thailand. And so we've got a similar radio astronomy training program uh, that's happening with DARA, but now also going on in, in Thailand. And most recently, we, we, we had a new project uh, that tried to sort of bring the whole global community together and try and learn a few lessons uh, globally about you know, bringing together all the people around the world in developing countries with experts to, uh, to see how we can uh, you know, push this message uh, further out and learn from each other and help each other into a global network. So the way that worked was this uh, development with Radio Astronomy Global Network Program. We basically ran four workshops uh, during 2019. Uh, so in this picture here, you can see the first one in Ghana, um, where we had a whole workshop on uh, dish conversion. It was opened by the Deputy Science Minister, uh, you can see sitting here. And you know we were getting participants from over 30 developing countries around the world. Um, Next, we went on to Mexico, where this is the dish that's being converted. You can see here in the background of this group picture. Uh, and from there, we brought everyone to Goon Hilly uh, to see it firsthand how you can bring together uh, the radio astronomy techniques with uh, you know, commercial uh, space sector business and, and, and drive economic development that way. And a final one was held with sort of big data uh, techniques and technology uh, in, in Thailand. So that was funded by a, a different mechanism uh, to the Newton Fund in the UK. So there is another similar fund in the UK called the Global Challenge Research Fund. Um, and it's actually much bigger than the Newton Fund. It's 1.5 billion over uh, the last sort of five years. Again, it uses the, the aid budget of the UK government, the uh, official development assistance budget. Um, it's, it's different to Newton in that it doesn't have to be a bilateral with a particular country. It can be with any, any uh, lower middle income country. And it, it very much has, your project has to address uh, some of the UN sustainable development goals. So if you're not familiar with those and you're interested in this area, then I, I would urge you to go and have a look at those. So we have to, any project that is going to bid for this fund has to, has to tick these boxes. And it may well be that our future DARA funding might come from this stream rather than the Newton stream. So in terms of UN uh, sustainable development goals that we believe the current sort of DARA project uh, ticks, then there's certainly uh, one around this area in terms of increasing the number of people with sort of uh, technical skills. Uh, I think we do that and we certainly try and uh, instill uh, a spirit of entrepreneurship, you know, through people like Ian, um, who are experienced entrepreneurs, uh, uh, and, and Steve and people like that, and, and encouraging people to think about starting businesses. So we think we, we certainly tick that one. <clears throat> uh, there's also the sort of technology uh, aspect uh, in itself of, you know, developing uh, uh, higher level technology. Uh, so obviously you've got the, the big telescopes that are going on, uh, you've got radio astronomy uh, instrumentation. Uh, the picture on the right here is actually the, uh, the, the feed horn and receiver that um, uh, Dillis Abanda has designed during his PhD funded by DARA in, in, in Oxford. And so there's you know, quite a lot of high tech uh, work going on. And a lot of this will have applications in, in other fields as well as radio astronomy, of course. And of course, we're also very much about building uh, partnerships and networks across the globe. Um, and so we think, you know, we definitely tick the boxes of uh, generating uh, new partnerships. So there have also been a few changes now in the um, perspective coming out of South Africa, of course, which is very important from the sort of engineering and technical side of the development of um, you know, the African, uh, the ABN sort of network. So when we first started, you know, the, the whole thing was very much about converting these big dishes into, into radio telescopes in many of the countries. Um, but of course, to date, we've still only con 
successfully converted the dish in Ghana and no other dish conversions have, have started. Um, so part of that is the amount of time and money it took for the Ghana conversion and, and there's, a, there's a bit of a, a lack of funding now in, in South Africa and that obviously they've got to deliver uh, Meerkat and, and the SKA itself. So they're sort of focusing on that. And so there's under a sort of Carla Sharp's leadership, there is now a, a changing perspective coming out of the um, South Africa, which is more to do with what's called sort of co-location program. It's co rather than building the radio telescope first, uh, perhaps developing uh, commercial services on these ground stations f uh, first. So using the example of Goon Hilly, you know, you've got various options. You've got normal sort of satellite communications. Potentially you could use big dishes for deep space communications if you can get the funding that way. Uh, usually these places have big buildings and fiber connections, which means it's perfect for a data center like it's been established at Goon Hilly. And putting all this stuff together where you've got satellite data, big computing and fiber networks and clever academics uh, with skills in multi multi-wavelength uh, economy and you can, uh, you can put all that together so uh, and do some clever AI big data type work on applied systems either in agriculture or health those kind of things so that's much more the sort of idea now coming out of South Africa okay so let's now finish up by thinking about where we're going with Dara in the future so uh, We've already been, you know, as we come to the end of phase two, we've, a lot of us have been thinking about outline plans for what we'd like to do next, which we're referring to as phase three. Um, it's already quite encouraging that, you know, the DARA still has a very high profile uh, in the ministries in South Africa and the UK. And that was reflected by the fact that our funders, STFC, asked us, you know, roughly what kind of budget we wanted if we were going to go forward so we uh, obviously dreamt up a large number and justified it uh, so we're, we're we're looking at a sort of joint project between DAR and DAR big data of over 16 million pounds over five years is kind of what we've submitted and again there's there's no detail in there it's just an indicative budget level um, which is obviously a, a significant increase on what we're doing at the moment and as I mentioned already we're not really sure whether Newton or GCRF will continue yet. We suspect they will, we're fairly confident they will, but we're still now waiting for a government spending review uh, to find out uh, if that is the case. But of course, along with everything else, that's also now been delayed, so we're gonna have to wait another year, I think, for that. So it gives us a bit more time as well to, to think about things. So here, I just wanna use the next three slides to kind of outline our current thinking and of course, we'd very much like your input and comments and suggestions on, on this and, uh, and, and other things that we might, we might do. So in terms of the basic training, so that's you know, going and giving people an introduction to radio astronomy. Um, at some level, we'd like to ramp that down. Um, and in the interests of making everything self-sustaining, you know, we, we don't, the UK people, we don't want to have to come and teach astronomy in Africa forever, but very much though we like doing so. Um, you know, we want to hand that over so that that can be done uh, uh, in country in a self-sustainable way. And so here the idea is that, you know, we've got a lot of uh, PhD students who are now finishing both, you know, from the DARA program in, in, in the UK, and, but also <clears throat> obviously a lot of people funded through the Soreo HCD program as well, who could return to their home countries, get positions in universities, and actually start to teach astronomy at undergraduate and master's level. Obviously, that's where we're hoping uh, many people will, will go in the next few years. Now, you know, we're not gonna walk away, obviously, with the, from that, then the DARA team, many of us are uh, experts in the sort of curriculum of, of, of delivering astronomy, and so we'd like to provide curriculum support uh, to the universities and the people teaching the astronomy. So that, that would be quite a, a part of the new project, I think. And we'd probably still keep the technical training courses going at Hartrow and, and, in, and in Ghana, because obviously, you know, most countries don't have access to those big telescopes and the kind of kit at, the, at those uh, locations. So we would probably keep the sort of unit two, three aspect going. 
Um, another thing we may well do is try and open up that kind of technical training to other African countries, the GCRF project uh, that we, I mentioned just now. You know, we had a lot of interest from other countries, you know, Uganda, Tanzania, Algeria, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, all of these kind of places are kind of interested in the radio astronomy as well. And also the South Africans themselves would like to open up that training to uh, sort of historically disadvantaged South African students as well. So that's another aspect. Mm -hmm. In terms of the advanced training, obviously we very much want to keep that going. We see that as a, as a big success and that's gonna be needed uh, you know, over the next five years as well. Uh, so many more uh, PhDs, both in the UK uh, and, in, and in Africa. So there we, we would also like to switch some of that emphasis more to funding PhDs and MPhils directly uh, in, uh, in Africa. Um, especially where you know there are some astronomers already in some of our partner institutions in in Africa then um, often they're struggling to find the funding for for sort of mass especially master students and so we think we can do a, lo a lot more of that as well so we definitely keep that going but even the total number here you know probably doesn't satisfy even the number of people on this call who are still hoping to do a to do a master's or a PhD so um, that's always a, an uphill struggle to get enough funding. But the new thing we want to do is to uh, move up the, the sort of HCD pipeline, if you like, and uh, in, our, in our minds kind of complete the, the task by directly funding postdoctoral research fellows uh, in, uh, in, in Africa. And so certainly our, our current thinking from the DARA perspective is that we would fund these postdocs actually directly in the African universities. Okay, uh, so you'd, you'd get something like a three year postdoc, maybe a four year one. Um, and we want to do a significant number of these. Um, obviously we'd continue to support them through collaborations with, that have been built up over the DARA program with the UK and South African partners. Um, but it, this is really to, to really kickstart radio astronomy groups uh, in, 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 the, in the various uh, Af African partner countries. We would probably also, uh, you know, those, those postdocs could also help supervise uh, some local master students that were also funded by DARA. So it might come as a, a kind of package, if you like. Mm. So that's going to require the agreement of the host universities to to employ people as a postdoc, which is kind of a new concept in several countries. Uh, we'd also obviously want to make sure that at the end of the three years that you were then permanently employed at the university. So there will, there will need to be a, an agreement with the university that they take you on, they don't load you up with teaching uh, and and that you can do your radio astronomy research. But because this will still be funded by uh, official development funds, then we can't just fund people to do radio astronomy because that will not satisfy the development criteria. And so the time will have to be split that these people will do between, you know, maybe, I don't know, two thirds, one third, something like that, where they're doing uh, some development activity, which is most likely to be involved with as I talked earlier about these co-located sort of space related business uh, activities. So, you know, it could be remote sensing, could be AI or big data analytics. It could be more on the technical side of getting ground station antennas uh, up and running, uh, could be HPC processing, any of those kind of things that are not directly radio astronomy necessarily, but using your skills uh, to help uh, develop uh, a sort of an industrial commercial sector on the, on the uh, ground station sites. So that's the real sort of new thing, and I'd very much like people's thoughts on, on that uh, as an idea. Uh, on the big data side, then um, you've got eight of these so-called translational postdoc fellows. So again, that's very similar to the current big data philosophy where they would be using skills, you know, in radio astronomy and translating them into other applied areas of uh, health and agriculture, etc. Okay. So just to summarize then, um, well, I should probably say by 2022 now, then Dara will have you know, trained over 
300 people in basic astronomy, radio astronomy. We should have around 30 people with PhDs or masters. Hopefully we'll have got some successful business startups underway, some development projects that have really uh, also developing into, into sustainable activities. And we'll be you know, helping with the uh, development of co-located services with the, in partnership with Soreo. In the future, you know, the still the ultimate aim is still there to establish these sustainable radio astronomy research groups in each country so that every country is ready for uh, SKA when it comes and hand in hand with that to really develop uh, these applied research and co-located businesses on, on each of these uh, sites in each country. So that's the where we really want to, to, to go in the future. Okay, I will uh, stop there and stop sharing my screen. And um, at this point, uh, hopefully we can uh, hand over to Mark to pick out a few questions, perhaps if any questions have been asked. I don't have no idea if any questions have come, been coming in. But... Everyone's been very polite, Melvin, has been listening to you and not asking any questions. So. Okay. Uh... Now is the time, everybody. <clears throat> if you have a question, can you please uh, type it into the chat and uh, I'll come back to you and ask you to ask your question to Melvin. I have been very quiet. So yeah, so please, any questions, it doesn't have to be a question even, maybe just a comment, just to get some discussion going. You know, we've got uh, a good 20 or 30 minutes, we can uh, do that. I presume, Trish, that we're not gonna be cut off at 12 o'clock. Uh, mm. um. No, we shouldn't be. Jolly good. Okay. Anyone, any comments, questions? Or maybe maybe the connections were so poor that no one heard my talk at all. But uh, hopefully that's not the case. Okay. Okay. So maybe we should... Uh, oh. Something's come in there. Yeah, there's oh. a few coming in. Yeah. Uh, so we have a comment from Sam. Uh, I don't, Sam, I don't know if you want to unmute your microphone and uh, pose that to, to Melvin, and then we can maybe talk about it. Okay, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so my comment was, uh, I think it might be useful to have a more intensive business development portion of the basic training, just so people who are more inclined to, um, I guess, start a business rather than pursue a master's, um, they might have something to work with. I don't yeah, know no, what everybody else thinks. No, that, that's a, a very good point. Um, we've been obviously, you know, sort of focusing on our core activity, which, you know, from the outset, because we were initially, it was a bunch of academics in radio astronomy, then that was our focus at the beginning. Um, um, and I, I brought Steve Jones in, you know, some, some way along the project because A, I had a bit of money and B, I knew he was available at the time, but uh, he's also only available, you know, on a part-time basis. So, um, as certainly I think as part of the, you know, the next phase, then we could ramp that aspect up uh, if we wanted to. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe developing perhaps some specific, you know, sort of week-long training courses or something that, that address that aspect, as well as providing the sort of one-to-one -one support. Would that, would that be something that you think might be useful, Sam? Um, yeah, um, that's pretty much what I was thinking, but maybe also like longer term. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you said that uh, you wanted the PhD students to return home to split their time between uh, research and a radio astronomy related business. Um, yep. So does it have to be the PhD students that do the business stuff as well or um, no, would there be separate all. funding? No, it could be separate funding. Uh, and you know, that's kind of crossed my mind as well. I mean, <laughs> I don't think we, we, I don't think Dara should be an investment bank, actually. <laughs> but, uh, I'm not sure we want to go that far because that would be quite risky. And um, I'm not sure that our funders would let us do that necessarily. So, I mean, part of uh, Steve's role really is uh, in also helping people to win funding, you know, in a normal sort of business development sense of, of getting loans or, 
or grants or those kind of things. And I think, so we, we'd probably go more down that route, that route I think. Um, but there's kind of seed cord funding, um, you know, like we've been handing out the, the 5K uh, for the development project. So I think, you know, we could also think about doing that to, to individuals, uh, individual based projects as well. And certainly more long term, as you can see, you know, we're definitely thinking of a of a new sort of five year project if they'll let us have it. I don't know if they'll let us have a five year project. It might, it might be a four year one, but but that 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 kind of in it for the long term is, is definitely where we want to be. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so the, the next question we have is from Deliso. Um, uh, so Deliso, do you want to unmute and ask Melvin your question? Oh, hi. Um, yeah, one of the things you mentioned was translational postdocs. I didn't quite uh, understand what you mean by those. Yep. Uh, thanks, Delisso. Um So that's a term that sort of Anna Scaife really uses for, for her Big Dara Big Data project. So the translation there really means, you know, translating skills from one field to another. So, you know, ideally from a from an ODA point of view, then that means skills that have been developed uh, as part of radio astronomy being translated into another applied field, you know, whether it's, you know, remote sensing, um, you know, whether it's in, you know, like medical imaging, remote sensing imaging, and the, and the analysis thereof and that kind of thing. I mean, perhaps coming more to your perspective from an instrumentation point of view, you know, it could be skills or techniques that you've developed in order to make, you know, frontline radio astronomy receivers, but, you know, translating that into something that could be used for commercial satcoms or telecoms or something like that, that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, thank you. That, yeah. that makes it clear for you. Okay, so our next question is from uh, Naomi. Um, uh, so uh, go ahead, Naomi, and unmute your mic. Hi, everyone. Hi, Melvin. Um, Hi, Naomi. Um, I wanted to know about the students who just completed their basic training and have not had a chance to advance to the advanced training you know, stage of the DARA. Is there any plans to maybe put them into internships in? maybe South Africa or Ghana or Hili, so they can do maybe a three months thing with them to get some more uh, training or get some more experience working with the telescope as they prepare to either go towards advanced training or whatever field they want to, if they are interested, because not everyone is interested in still continuing with astronomy, that's fine, but those who are interested, is there any plans to give them some form of internship training with these working telescopes or yeah thanks for that um i mean at the moment i would say we don't have those kind of plans i mean the, there is a little bit of scope for some internships through the jumping jive program um but obviously that is also coming to an end and we we need to make sure we can sort of deliver the core of what uh the jumping jive program is is doing as well um so there might be scope for one or two there um i think you know there is going to be a you know even before we had the uh the virus outbreak um there was going to be perhaps a, a slight delay there and people will have to be a little bit patient um of course, as you can see, the plan is, of course, none of this is funded for phase three at all yet, um, but the plan is that we would um, have a lot more masters and PhDs, you know, starting probably now in, in 2022. Um, and I think, you know, at some level, people are gonna have to be, have to be patient. Uh, I guess this, the Soreo HCD program will still be going ahead, although that's getting a little, a little bit more restrictive for uh, the AVN partner countries perhaps as well. Um, so it, you know, we will support people wherever they apply, apply to, um, you know, as well. There's, you know, people should not just look to DARA to fund their next stage. There are many other outlets and, and funded programs out there and, you know, getting references from, from your, uh, 
sort of experienced DARA trainers can really help you get a position uh, and a scholarship uh, if you want to keep uh, proceeding on in the meantime. But, you know, at some level, a little bit of patience now while we wait for this outbreak to, to calm down and, and, we, and we get the new funding is going to be required, unfortunately. Thanks, Melody. Okay. Okay, so we have a, a couple of people who've asked uh, essentially the same question. So I think I'll, I'll ask their question for them. So apologies, Mikadi and Isaac, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal your limelight. Um, uh, so the common question is, um, what will happen to the unit two and three training uh, for 2020? Do, do we have any dates on that yet? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously the, that unit two, three training was supposed to be starting in a few weeks time. Effectively, we are postponing that for uh, a year. So uh, we hope to to run that training now. We're not, we haven't pinned down the exact dates now, but it'll be somewhere over the sort of March, April, May timeframe next year with the unit four following on soon afterwards uh, in the sort of June time of next year. So like everybody's life at the moment, sort of everything is kind of put on hold for sort of six to 12 months, really. Um, and that's unfortunate. Obviously, none of us can travel anywhere. And well, many of us are not even leaving our house, let alone going anywhere else. So, <laughs> so you know, um, we're, all in the, we're all in this together, I guess. Um, and um, as I said before, hopefully you're also staying safe wherever you are as well. And we just have to hunker down until this is over and, uh, and then we will resume next year. And I think, you know, this was the decision taken by the steering committee that we, we couldn't, we don't think we, we couldn't risk trying to do it sort of later in the, you know, August, September this year, because we're not sure um, that we'd be able to. Okay, thank you, Melvin. Um, our next question is from Samuel Olatunde. So Samuel, do you want to unmute your mic and ask Melvin? Hello, Melvin. Oh, good. hi, Sam. Hope you're doing good. I'm good. Uh, I wanted to suggest if it is possible that we could have this video conferencing for the basic training to keep us active till the pandemic is over. We are going to rest over the one year break. And then I believe that if uh, we have sections from time to time, it is going to keep us uh, on track and also build up till we meet again uh, for the meetings. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea. Um, sort of like, like an extended unit one type of thing. Is that what you had in mind, Sam? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause when we had our steering committee, um, to decide how to move forward a while back then uh, Ian Jones said well you know can we not do unit two or three training virtually but you know by its very nature it's very hands-on and practical and using equipment um, and so we didn't think that you know that was a feasible option at all um, pretty much with the data reduction training it would be quite difficult to do that virtually really um, but I think in terms of perhaps sort of continuing the unit one and extending it a little bit, uh, that is quite a good idea, I would say. I don't know, Mark, you've got any thoughts as a unit one lecturer? You're, you're muted, I think. Uh, yes, I was muted. Uh -huh. uh, yes, I, I think it would be possible. I mean, certainly, you know, this, this kind of format like e-seminars, um, you know, where you, you could get somebody to, to give a talk and that could be, you know, recorded and then made available. Um, it could be on some aspect of radio astronomy that we've done in the unit one courses, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, I think that could work. I mean, you know, we're not going to do eight hours of <laughs> an eight-hour session, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I think you know, an hour's lecture and maybe you know some some worksheets, a lot to go along with it that people can do in their own time, and then maybe a come back and have a Q and A live, perhaps with would be the way to do it maybe like a recorded bit as you were suggesting mark i think a recorded lecture then uh some worksheets to go with it and then a and then a q a mm. yeah yeah that's, that's what we're doing with our own teaching uh here yeah. at Hertfordshire. so yeah. that's, it seems to work okay um, yeah okay that sounds like a really good idea mm. 
Okay. I think James just suggested that as well. Uh, I see James Chibwezi online as well, yep. sending in lots of good suggestions. So thanks, James. Uh, in fact, James has a couple of questions. So James, uh, do you want to unmute and ask Melvin your, your questions? Hi, Melvin. Hey, James. How about you? I'm good. Hope you're staying safe. Yeah, staying home and staying safe. How are you doing, Mark? I'm muted, but I'm OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, Melvin, I wanted to find out from you. Uh, you made a comment on the postdocs being domiciled in their countries of residence. Um, is, is that a precondition? Uh, I'm sure you'd, what your aims are is to have them eventually employed, probably by the university at the end of three or four year postdoctoral contracts. Um, but would you consider, for example, having someone from Kenya being a postdoc in Northwest University in South Africa, and then at the end of four years, if you don't offer the person a uh, permanent position, the person would be able to find a job somewhere else? Is, is that something you have on the table? Um, I, I, okay, uh, when I saw your question in the, in the text, I thought it was a slightly different question, but um, I think given that there is already an existing, you know, Soreo postdoc scheme that funds postdocs in, um, in South Africa, then I don't think we'd want to quite duplicate that scheme. That, that's just my first initial thought. I know that there aren't very many of them and, it, and everyone always likes more postdocs, but that's just my initial thought and, and, and perhaps come back on that in a moment. Um, perhaps just to clarify what, or have a comment on what I thought your question might have been. Um, it's not, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't want it to be as restrictive as, you know, a Kenyan could not apply for a postdoc in Ghana or vice versa, for instance. So yeah. um, I think, you know, we're interested in a, in a pan, pan African collaboration here. And, you know, just like the model in Europe where people mo move around all over the place all the mm -hmm. time um, and will pick the best host university for their particular project that they want to carry out. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I think we will, we will leave it quite flexible and and my my whole picture of how this postdoc fellow scheme would work actually is that it would be very much driven by the applicant rather than by the funder by dara itself so we would invite applications so an individual would apply if you like to dara for the funding um they would state who their host university is and they will have had to negotiate in a sense the kind of conditions that Dara will impose on the postdoctoral fellowship themselves really with that university. I mean, maybe with help from us if, if need be. They come up with the, the research project and more importantly, they come up with the development project. Uh, and again, they need to discuss that with their host, uh, proposed host institution. And so when we judge those proposals, um, then it would be very much, you know, on the quality of the research project, but equally on the quality of the development project, the appropriateness of the host university, all of that kind of thing, just like a proper fellowship application in that sense. Okay. And okay, yeah. so they apply directly to Dara, not not an advertised position in some university, because I know universities in Ghana, Kenya, and some other countries do not advertise for postdocs. Well, there's no fun, there's no mechanism for postdocs in many yeah. of these countries. Yeah. So that's where the negotiation would have to be, you know, that, you know, that you'd need to find a host university that would be prepared to, to go down this route because it's, it, for many cases, it would be a new concept, a new thing. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, it's a bit like a tenure track position in that sense. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, and also very much protecting their research time, you know, so that they've only got a very limited time when they, when they would be available for teaching as well to protect their research time is kind of what we've got in mind. So there are quite well trodden paths for this already. The Royal Society have been running, um, you know, fellowships in Africa as part of the Newton Fund program for the last five years already. So we're going to very much sort of follow their model and their examples and, and learn from them because they've done it already basically. So they know what okay. works and what doesn't work in an African situation. All right. Um, Mark, should I ask the second question or 
Yeah, go ahead, uh, James, I can answer it. Um, Okay, good. So my second question was on the Thailand um, radio telescope. Do you have any plans? I see there are movements towards uh, Southeast Asia. Any plans to use that for the unit two and three type of training? Um, yeah, in answer to that, it, it's possible. Um, certainly in our kind of unit one style training in Thailand, we, um, we have opened that up to um, uh, students from other Southeast Asian countries. Um, and so it's possible that we could use the radio telescope in Thailand for a unit two, three type of training. Um, the, the issues are that firstly, they haven't finished building the telescope yet or commissioning it. So um, the focus uh, that they have is very much on commissioning the telescope rather than using it for training. Um, and the second issue is that uh, we, we did apply for phase three funding in Thailand, but we were not successful. Uh, so we are not quite sure how the Thai Thailand project is going to evolve in, in the future. Um, but uh, as, as Melvin said, uh, we're, we're also looking to try and get a year's extension on the existing project that we have. Um, so at the moment, we're just sort of crossing our fingers and hoping that we can do, we can keep, keep doing some more, some more stuff there for the next couple of years. Okay, maybe I would just like to mention that um, there is also another parallel effort similar to what you're doing that is happening from the Japanese side because we do have um I remember his name Zuil uh, he's, he's also from Thailand mm -hmm. and a number of students who are taking up advanced training in radio astronomy actually we've managed to take up one of them who joined um the Kava which is Korean VOBI network and yep. the Japanese Vera network uh, the Kava Star Formation Working Group, and he participates regularly in our meetings. He was actually there this morning in the meeting we had. So it would be nice to try to draw a synergy between these two training. Uh, if there is basic training ongoing, it could be a pipeline for getting students who get into this more advanced training to master's and PhD programs. And no, I, I understand that there is also some funding for this. Okay, well, that, that's a very good route. I have been talking to the uh, the Southeast Asian VLBI people, um, but uh, yeah, we'll keep we'll keep keep going on that on that avenue. Okay. Okay. So our next question is from Dennis Colvinder. So Dennis, if you want to unmute your mic and uh, ask Melvin your question. Hi everyone. Hi Dennis. Hi. Can you hear me, all of you? Sure. Okay, I wanted to ask uh, Melvin, it's because you are developing skills in the AVN capacity building. And so far, we, we check on the opportunities, opportunities available and you see astrophysics and only big data. I'm also surprised that the LISO got a, a scholarship on instrumentation. So some of us have been waiting maybe for the hardware side on the back end and uh, instrumentation, the telecommunication side. Are there opportunities for this for you? for some of us who are on the physical hardware side? Yeah, um, you know, that's been, you know, I'll admit that's been fairly limited to date within the DARA program. We've, we have, you know, mainly because of our, most of our background is sort of on the astrophysics side rather than the instrumentation side. Um, but like you, like you spotted, the exception there was, uh, was Deliso because, you know, he, got a PhD position with the Oxford group. So the Oxford group within the DARA collaboration is, is a purely radio astronomy instrumentation group. And so, so they were offering, um, they only offered those, those kind of uh, positions in, in the, on the instrumentation side. Um, there is a bit of that at the University of Manchester, but w they, they never really put forward sort of engineering projects uh, to DARA per se. So, so that's why it was quite limited. Um, another reason really why you probably saw less of it as well is that Oxford do not offer any master's opportunities at all. They just don't offer them. So there was never any opportunity to do those kind of master's type qualifications in, in the uh, instrumentation side of things. So it was kind of purely a limitation really of, of who ended up in the, in the DARA collaboration. Now, again, going forward then, um, I, we could explore trying to expand that side of it if we could bring more people with that kind of expertise into the into the DARA project or another 
avenue actually um as i mentioned you know we've we've been sort of dabbling with hiring an antenna engineer um there are other you know instrumentation projects going on around the world especially in latin america um it's highly possible and and i've already suggested this to sdfc as well that it would probably be a separate project that was focused much more on the sort of engineering side uh, rather than trying to make dire into this huge thing that satisfies everybody because um, it would probably require a, a different combination of, of academic departments probably and and engineering departments as well as sort of radio astronomy departments i think so I think that you know that's something that we need to think about for the future and perhaps you know try and build a team a new team even that that would be related to lead that it's not you know it's way outside of my comfort zone uh, and so I think you know building a, a, a slightly different team that that could branch off you know sort of a dire instrumentation type team if you like uh, would would perhaps be the way to do that um, I mean you talk about new MSc courses but um, again you know if you mean people from the UK coming and teaching an MSc in Africa, then that, that gets difficult sort of logistically and time-wise. Um, but it could be people coming from Africa to spend, you know, uh, an MS, to, to do an MSc in a, in a sort of radio astronomy and related uh, instrumentation, that, that might well work in a, in, a, in a UK setting. And it's certainly this, well, it, it, that might be difficult to fund uh, through, if, if we only get GCRF funding, because they do not, fund taught MSCs at all. In fact, it's difficult to get them to fund masters and PhDs actually. So, so you know, sometimes we have to, you know, we can only apply for the kind of restrictions on, on that we have in the funding in the first place. So. Um, but, you know, we're very much aware that there is this large hinterland of people who are much more interested on the, uh, the hardware side. And, uh, you know, we try not to forget you and, and we'll, we'll try to bring that in if we can but it might require a separate project i hope that answers attempts to address your question but, uh, yes yes uh, thank you for that yeah thanks dennis okay <clears throat> so we, we've had a flurry of questions coming in um how much time do we have left melvin it depends on if people are happy to keep going um trish do we have any ultimate limit yeah, so basically we've been going for just over an hour now, but uh, as Melvin said, maybe, you know, we'll just keep going for another 10-15 minutes. Certainly another 10-15 is fine, I think. Yep. Okay, that, that, that works. Right, so uh, the next question is from uh, Serum and Pofo, who uh, asked it earlier, but I, uh, I missed you, Serum. So please unmute your mic and ask Melvin your question. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Thompson. Hi, Melvin. Hey, Sarah. Yeah, so um, we have a lot of interest in commercializing knowledge we acquired during our basic training. Um, but then, is it possible to get an online training or a workshop in any kind of form so that we could put uh, in, uh, so that, that, that kind of workshop will help us to put our ideas together? Uh, we have, I have to, basically, personally, I have a difficulty in trying to organize my thoughts. So that I can push it through a uh, real organization. Is, it, is there any option that we can get or anything like you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think your question is similar to Sam's earlier, really, about you know how to push forward with the kind of developing business plans and that kind of thing. And I, you know, I'm I'm I was very aware, and I'm still quite excited about your your sort of business idea. If uh, assuming it's still the same as we talked about some years back, um, then. Um, I think it depends what, how much you can achieve through a workshop and how much you can achieve through kind of one-to-one -one, uh, advice. Um, I mean, I, th I think I'm aware that you have resumed or started talking to Steve Jones recently, and, and I would urge you to keep going on that route, you know, so that he can give you specific one-to-one -one advice, perhaps, on, uh, on your particular business idea, because, you know, the advice you give to one person for business advice may not be the same as you do for another. But although having said that, then I know Steve often has, uh, you know, he keeps asking the same set of questions to, to each person who approaches him. So maybe, maybe at some level there is scope for that, 
that kind of um, workshop or at least a, a kind of a lecture. Um, I mean, I, in my mind, I haven't asked Steve yet, but I was thinking that one of these future e-seminars could actually be delivered by Steve who could set out those kind of uh, general principles and, and the type of considerations that you need to make when putting together that business plan. So at least in terms of a session like this, I think we could definitely have one focused on, on that aspect and, um, and, and we should you know, take it from there, I think, after that. I think, you know, so there's some general principles that he can set out. Um, and again, maybe, that's, maybe that could turn into a series of uh, lectures, but um, I think you know, at some point you get down to the individual business plan itself and, and that's better on a one-to-one -one basis. And that's exactly why Steve is there. So you know, I would encourage you to, to definitely get back to him in the meantime and I will also uh, try and encourage Steve to give one of these uh, upcoming seminars. So again, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, if people can think about other topics and type that for these future e-seminars, um, I mean, the, the commercial sort of aspects is one I'd certainly like to, to get on this. I think I'd also like to get some of our um, finishing PhD students perhaps to, to give, a talk, give a talk about, you know, some of their work, you know, what it's actually like, what do they actually do on a PhD and, and their journey, you know, where they've, how they've come up through and where they're going, that kind of thing, I think would be, a, would be good for, a, for one or two of these as well. But if you've got other topics that you want, to hear about th through this kind of mechanism, then uh, please put those in the chat as well. Mm. Thank Does you very much. Your question, Sarah? Mm. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Right, and please keep in touch. Mm. Mm. Thank you, sir. Okay, will... okay, so our next question is from, from Wit. Uh, I'm sorry, Wit, I only have your Zoom handle, not your name. Uh, so your question was about business models and franchising. So if you'd like to ask Melvin your question. You'll need to unmute yourself, Whit. Yeah. I think I think this person may have left. Ah. Yes, I can't see their name on the list any longer. Okay, I, I can ask their question for them, uh, which is that, is it possible for Dara to develop business models that can be franchised to those willing to venture into business? Um, they've heard of astrophysics tourism. Can you please explain more? Yeah, um, I think they're asking the wrong person for the first question because it's kind of, a, you know, in business language that I hardly understand. Um, let's get one successful venture before we start to franchise it, I think would be my, <laughs> would be my answer to that. But maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Um, but astrotourism, then, you know, that, you know, the Sar uh, Sayari project that I talked about earlier on during the talk is, is one example where, you know, you use astronomy to try and boost tourism uh, in your country. Um, you know, there are a lot of tourists out there who um, have an interest perhaps in exploring more about the night sky and that kind of thing. And if you can combine that activity with some other kind of tourist activity, uh, and you can then charge people uh, for that, or because it because it brings more people in uh, than the company, the tourism company is more successful, then you are, you know, basically generating jobs and wealth uh, through an astronomy connection. So that is a classic kind of astronomy development project, the kind of thing that is supported by uh, the OAD uh, during their calls as well. And it's the kind of thing that we've been trying out through our DARA development projects. And you know, and especially in the African context, the, in the game reserves, I think that that model works quite well. So there are many countries uh, that have sort of started to explore this. Kenya, certainly Mozambique has tried this a little bit as well with some of the Dara trainees. Um, I think it could probably work in, in maybe in Botswana as, as well and, and maybe Zambia. So, you know, there's, and perhaps Madagascar as well, combining with the kind of the wildlife there as well and so there's you know there's quite a quite a lot of scope for this um and you know if you've got um people who've been inspired through astronomy with the dara training um you know you've got a perhaps a project going on the ground with a radio telescope then you can link all of that together and and make quite a nice package i think if you link up with a with a business 
Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Melvin. Um, we have a, a, another question from uh, which is linked uh, to that topic from uh, Andrews uh, Zozomenio. Um, so, Andrews, if you want to unmute and ask Melvin your question. Um, so, hello, hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, Melvin. Yeah. Um, so, my question is about um, the advanced students. So, there's like PhD levels and master's levels. And um, if there can be like a sort of platform for research collaborations, for example, the let's let's say the um, big data students might be more advanced in coding and all that than the um, regular research um, astrophysics students, and sometimes you just probably need some help with some code or some advice. So if there's like a a platform sort of like a stack exchange how stack exchange works um you could just put your question out there and one of the direct students from whichever level could just assist you or something which would um help with overcoming bottlenecks in research research um the research environment sometimes um you can't get specific solutions online and there's like um an alumni who has already worked on a similar thing and can easily advise but you don't know them because they are all about the world yeah. okay that's my question yeah thanks andrews and um it certainly uh, sort of returns to a theme that we've experienced here with the uh the advanced training students in the in the uk so uh, each year we get We've been getting everyone together, as I showed you earlier, uh, in one of the pictures down at down at Goon Hilly, um, and we've been joining together with the Dara Big Data students in, in, on those recent meetings as well. And, and at the last one, uh, we tried to set up that came up, and we we did set up a uh, a platform on Slack to do exactly this. Um, but uh, maybe Trish could come on and update us. But as far as I'm aware, then even though even though it was set up, actually there wasn't much traffic on it uh, to date anyway um of course there's nothing stopping us extending that to um sort of dara funded and related students like yourself in uh, in africa um and you know maybe that might be the way to uh perhaps get get some traffic on on that site so uh trish did you want to comment uh, Yes, uh, so as you said, uh, there wasn't much traffic at all. Um, but um, you know, we we really do want to push forward with with Slack. I think it's a good platform, as you say, for some form of collaboration. Um, so um, I'll put that on my to do list just to try and get that moving again. And of course, as you said, we will invite the wider circle of uh, advanced students to join that. Yeah, I think that'd be good. And. Perhaps, Andrews, you can, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're motivated by some reason, so you can post your, uh, you know, Python-related problem <laughs> to, uh, to that straight away and see if you can get some traffic going, maybe, maybe a good way to do it. Yeah, and, and also on that note, what we um, do ask is that we have uh, one of our advanced students or one of the members of the group to, to basically uh, manage that group for a three-month period. So uh, I may come knocking on your door, Andrews, uh, you seem... I should say, quite motivated to, to get this, this going. So uh, I may be in contact. Sure. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me scroll back through the chat to figure out what we're doing next. Uh, our next question was from Coloso. So Coloso, do you want to unmute your mic and ask Melvin your question, please? Can you hear me? We can. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me. My question is quite simple in that I really want to understand the approach when it comes to doing the advanced training. Suppose I want to incorporate machine learning into this project. Does Dara provide a platform for me to improve that skill set or we are simply going to do the same thing, all of us? <laughs> um. Uh, so just to clarify, you, you said machine learning then, is that right? Coloso? Yes, I did machine learning. Yeah, okay. Well, that's very much the core remit of the DARA big data project rather than the, the DARA project itself. 
So all of the um, advanced training opportunities provided through the DARA Big Data Project have been, um, you know, have that as a central theme of all of them. Um, okay. Now, you know, that the funding for that project is also uh, coming to an end now. So they've, you know, they've recruited all of the uh, masters and PhDs that they're that they're going to do with the current set of funding. But of course, we very much want to continue that aspect uh, in the next phase three of this combined Dara Dara Big Data project. Anyway, um, so there will be hopefully future opportunities if we win the funding for exactly that kind of project. Um, I mean, you meant uh, you kind of mentioned you know in the text there about. You know, can you pick your area of speciality for your advanced yeah, training yeah. project, perhaps, as a, as a sort of yeah. more general question? Now, the way we've run it to date has been very much along the lines of, you know, we put out a booklet of projects um, because obviously, you know, we've got a, a supervisor will have to supervise this project. And, and, and so we usually are putting out particular uh, examples of projects that we will uh, we have data available or or code available in order to in order to provide oh. but I think during each of those prospectus we 've also welcomed um, people to suggest their own project and we okay. then attempt to find a supervisor to fit okay to supervise that project so you know if you 've got something very specific uh, that you want to do, then we will try and find a supervisor to do it within the project but of course that 's not always possible. Okay, okay. So that's kind of the way it works. Yeah. And usually okay. it's a bit of an iteration and a, and a compromise between the two. So. Okay. Okay, but no, that's a good, good Thank point. You. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to take two final questions. Um, and the first of those is a question from Sam uh, about advanced training. So, Sam, please ask Melvin your question. Hi again. Um, so my question is, uh, have you considered offering advanced uh, training opportunities online? Because um, I'm not sure how feasible it is logistically, but I think it might enable more people to do the training. Um, maybe it would be easier on funding. And also people with maybe some family commitments who can't leave home that easily would be able to access the training. Um, is it something that you've thought about or...? Yeah, thank, uh, thanks for that, Sam. Uh, we, yeah, a couple of years ago, we thought about it a lot, um, especially when um, uh, the UCLan, one of the more recent uh, UK university members, uh, joined the DARA collaboration because they run a, a sort of distance learning uh, course in astronomy already. Uh, I think that's more at the BSc level. Uh, we were also looking at trying to link up with another UK university that was offering... Uh, a master's uh, in astrophysics uh, through a distance learning. Um, and it was for very much the reasons that you, you outlined yourself. Um, but then when we looked into it a bit further, we came up against the fundamental problem uh, that the Newton Fund that funds DARA will not fund a taught master's course. Uh, it's not allowed. Mm it's got to be research. So we can fund the sort of the one year masters by research and the two year sort of MPhil research that's going on in Mauritius, but we cannot fund courses that are, you know, effectively a sort of taught course, if you like. So the only way we could do advanced training online would be if it was like a research degree, pure research. And I think my opinion is that that probably doesn't work. It, trying to remotely supervise is, is not 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 usually ideal in any shape or form mm -hmm. okay fair enough that answers my question thank you yeah okay thanks mm. okay so our last question is from sonic uh sonic mumba uh so sonic would you like to unmute and ask melvin your question Okay, maybe uh, maybe Sonic may have left. I, I can ask their question for them, um, which is that: uh, Is there any basic training for DARA big data? Yeah, I think the basic answer is no. Um, so, in terms of um, 
you know, an equivalent to the, the basic training program that we run within DARF on the sort of radio astronomy side. Um, the DARF big data project never did that. They only basically do the advanced training part, the, the masters and the, and the PhDs. Um, they do, however, run workshops. Um, I'm not so clear about the detail about exactly if they're totally open to, every, to anyone who wants to apply or not. Um, but they've, they've run many workshops uh, in Africa on, on big data. Um, what I'm not quite sure about is if they're closed to their sort of the people who are already kind of within the program. Uh, I, th I think not. I think they've run ones that are open as well. And certainly early on in the DARA project, we funded a couple of, or we contributed to the funding of a couple of big data summer schools as well in, 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 a, in South Africa. Um, so I think that's the closest you get really is are those kind of workshops. I, I don't know if there are going to be any more, but uh, in the current funding situation, I don't, I don't think there are. But again, as part of the, I didn't outline everything that we were putting in the, the phase three uh, proposal, especially on the big data side, but there will be more of those kind of uh, workshops and hackathon type uh, activities going forward as part of the big data side of any new project, that's for sure. So, so in that sense, there will be, but it's not, you know, it's not eight weeks of continuous training like we do on the, on the DARA program. It'll be a one or two week uh, training school. Okay, thank you, Melvin. Um, do we have time for one last question that came in after I close the questions on chat? Sure. Okay, so the very last question uh, that we have is uh, from Yara Simango. So Yara, if you want to unmute and ask Melvin your question. I, uh, I, I had some connection problem for a short time during the presentation. I don't know if I missed this part, but I would like to know if do you consider the possibility of having a fund allocated specifically for outreach activities in the AVN countries? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yara, and I think it's very appropriate that we end on a question from, from you, Yara, because uh, Yara is one of the uh, master students who was supposed to be starting in Leeds this week under my supervision. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, obviously, you know, we're going to have to wait uh, a few months for this to blow over. So thanks very much for joining and, and your question and very much looking forward to seeing you hopefully in October. Um, so outreach is a, another of these activities that we like to do and we have funded uh, a round or so of these from time to time when we get some additional funding from a select, from the GCRF side rather than the Newton side. And again, the problem is that the Newton fund itself does not allow us to fund outreach activities directly. Uh, and so that's why we, we've had to limit what we can do in terms of directly funding outreach activities. I mean, there have been quite a lot of um, of those kind of activities going on in various countries uh, that, w that we have provided a bit of support for. Uh, again, we'd very much like to do more of that. And I think in the future, if the funding comes from the GCRF funding route rather than the Newton funding route, then we could definitely do a lot more of that, and we would. Um, but in the current constraints of the Newton fund, then, then we can't really. Um, so we need to you know, see if we can get additional money for that from other routes. Of course, there's also an IAU uh, Office of Astronomy for Outreach, um, and they also have uh, small funds that you can apply to. Uh, and so I think, you know, I would encourage people who are interested in the outreach side to very much go and explore uh, those other sort of alternative uh, funding routes as well, if you, if you haven't already. And, um, and a lot of people at the OAD that are our partners on the uh, on the on the Dara project, you know, are also very knowledgeable about that aspect, and so we can we can also get you some advice if you if you have specific questions. Okay, so I okay, think. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Yara. So uh, many thanks everybody for staying with us. We still have sixty odd participants on the call, so that's great. Um, I think, I mean, please. Uh, you know, you can uh, keep keep comments and questions coming in to sort of me or me or directly or, or Trish. Um, 
about, you know, especially let us know if the technology actually worked. Um, so uh, Yara just mentioned, you know, maybe the uh, was coming in and out of the connection sometimes. So perhaps if you can feed back to us, you know, if it worked well, um, that you can hear and see the, the talk well enough that doing it this way, because obviously we're, we're trying to learn here. Um, if you've got more suggestions for future um, future topics, then keep those coming in as well. We'll try and put a program together uh, as we go forward. Um, I noticed a comment about, you know, having, having some on the big data front as well. Um, we Jeffrey, if you can keep muted for a moment. Oh, that would be useful. Um, so, Perhaps welcome, or uh, you know, thanks everyone for for coming on board. Um, thanks to Mark for doing a great job handling the handling the questions and, uh, and 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 sharing things. That was excellent. And of course, many thanks to Trish for setting the whole thing up. Um, we're aware that originally we had we're also learning how to do this as well because we we had well over a hundred people actually um, say they were interested in coming on. Um, but, and so with some people we didn't send the link to because we had, we thought we were going to have more than the hundred license that we've got. But of course, any, I don't know how many we got up to maximum 60 odd something. So, so maybe we need to learn there and perhaps, you know, let more people, uh, or send the link to more people than the actual hundred license and it'll just be first come first serve, I think. So we're, again, any, any thoughts on that would also be uh, useful. Okay, um, Trish, any last comments or? Uh, yes, so just to echo, thank you very much for attending. Um, I will now uh, start planning the next e-seminar. So we've got some topics to, to work on, so thank you. Uh, can I just remind everybody just to uh, keep looking at our websites for any updates. Uh, if you haven't already joined the, the CLOS uh, Facebook group, uh, this is for students, please do. Again, we, we post on there regularly. And to follow us on Twitter, uh, this is another uh, mechanism that we use just to announce uh, what's happening uh, with DARA and any seminars. So um, if you haven't already done so, just uh, please make sure you uh, register using the chat um, so then we can register your participation. Thank you very much. Okay, well thanks again everyone. Um, we hope to make it a kind of a monthly series and so we'll, uh, you know, we'll try and uh, get one set up for uh, for uh may yes and uh and 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 let's uh push on from there so many thanks to everyone and uh let's call it a day there so stay safe everybody thank you melvin stay safe everyone bye bye, bye everyone